Well, it's uh, good to be here, uh, Mount Evelyn, once again, as we come to engage with with uh, John chapter 9. So let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this passage today. And Lord, that uh, each of us will be able to hear, see, and, and listen to what the Lord is, is saying to us. And be with this, th- be with this preacher, that he preaches your word faithfully and true. In this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Why are some people born with a disability? It seems so counter to what we expect. I know that when our children were born, we, uh, we saw that they had um, arms, legs, head, and everything else was moving, and it may well be that one of them stuck their hand out before they were ready to come. But anyway, um, it, it, was, it was a joy to see them. But that's not always the case, is it? It seems counter to what we would, to, to what we would expect. Questions are asked as to what was the cause of the disability? And these days we hear many things about DNA and, and all sorts of um, things. I don't really have the foggiest, but I'm just a bloke who, who hears these things. But John chapter 9 opens up with this such question, uh, verses 1 and 2. As he, that is Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth, and disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. So obviously they were looking for a cause, and the cause to the blindness was, in their eyes, um, blindness, um, uh, it, was, it was because of sin. And Jesus said, replied, that it was not for sin or whoever sinned, rather that the works of God may be displayed through him. Interesting use of the word, displayed for someone who was born blind. Displayed for all to see. And one of the works that the that works of God to be to, to, to be displayed through him, well in verse six and seven we find this out. After saying this he spit on the ground, made some mud with with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seen. Even though these works were on full display for all to see, there were many around who said, uh, I see it, but I don't believe it. <laughs> I see it, but I, I, I cannot accept it. I see it, and it's on full display, and I reject it. I see it, and I will never come to the terms of, of, of what this man has just said. But I have no other explanation. So then John takes us on a journey to experience the blindness of the people surrounding the once blind man. And some of those uh, uh, who, who, were, who, who were blind to all that was going on suggest the following. Uh, is it the same man that, 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 that was here before? Well, perhaps he's been substituted. Maybe he did a tap out, you know, and he's run, run away and he's got a mate of his who looks very much like him. Or perhaps there's a twin brother. Oh, that'd be it. There'd be a twin brother. And uh, you, you, you get some twins, don't you? And you, and you, there's, anyway, I won't go there. You get some twins who are almost impossible to tell apart, even, even later in life. Or perhaps there was a conspiracy, you know, with plenty of them at the moment. Um, perhaps he was never blind. He was just faking it until he could make it. I mean, maybe the, all these things, like, it was just overload. And in order to answer these questions and many suggestions, the, the uh, uh, fr- uh, friends of the man were called. They all said, yes, it is the same man. Uh, the, they were loyal to him. And they all testified that it was the same man. How, could, how he could see, though, was, well, 
haven't got the foggiest. It's a mystery. Then they talked with the parents. Is this your son? Yes. Uh, yes was the reply. Uh, was he born blind? Yes. How then can he see? Uh, ask him. <laughs> no idea. So the questions were then put to the man again. Uh, were you born blind? Yes. Uh, how then can you see? And in verse 11 and 12, he said, uh, the, the man, called, the, they, the man they, they called Jesus came and made some mud and put it in my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. You're asking someone who's blind where he is now. Uh, like, hello. The, the, the humour here, John just just hangs the humour in, just, just lays it on line from line from line. That, that you're asking a blind man, do you know where he is now? <laughs> Thank you, but I don't know. I don't even know what he looks like. Like, hello? <laughs> uh, man with a beard, I guess. How many of them are? Like, I, I don't know. You know bit, being a bit like in a school ground, with everyone got all the students in, in the same uniform. Hey, you and the green jumper. <laughs> Everyone turns around. Like, how would I know? And then the humour intensifies when he is then asked again how he can see. And verse 24 following, he says, a second time they summoned the man who'd been born blind. Give, give glory to God by, by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Hmm, okay. That's interesting. Um, he replied, whether he was a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. You get the point? Like, these things are open. They weren't open before. And then they asked him, what did he do to you? How can he open your eyes? He said, well, I've told you already, if you had listened, like, hello. Why do you want me to hear it again? I know what the clue is. This is him talking to the Pharisees, these guys who are, you know, the super religious. Um, and he says to them, do you want to be Jesus' disciples as well? I mean, followers of Jesus and say that he was the Christ. No, no, no. The, the humour has been laid time and time and time again. And John must have been cacking himself when he was writing this. Well, I certainly was when I was reading it. <laughs> then I thought I'd better settle down. Not only were they unable to see the works of God which were on full display, but they're unable to hear the works of God when spoken. They were on full display, yet they had their ears blocked and blindfolded to the truth. It was there before them, on full display. So in response, they threw him out of the city, out of the synagogue, out of his community, all because they were blind and deaf. They were blind and deaf to the works of God that are on full display. They had created their own truth based on their own inventions of their own mind. Calvin called the mind the factory of idols and they were manufacturing idols by the dozen this morning we see and hear the inventions of people's minds replacing the works of God that are on full display each and every day I'll pick three consider creation evolution the evidence of God's work is before the eyes of all, yet the inventions of the minds are manufactured as idols and held and taught as truth. Yet the works of God are in full display. Consider gender. The politics of gender is never more apparent than today. The works of God are in full display, yet there are deliberate actions to remove 
those works of God and replace it with inventions of people's minds as idols, <laughs> idols to be included. Consider religious freedoms. The works of God are on full display through God's grace being, being experienced daily in, in all sorts of settings. Yet the cameras are turned away to highlight the hatred between various people, most often not Christians. And this is then taught that freedoms need to be outlawed and so freedom is replaced with restraint. Their eyes are blinded and their ears are covered and they only speak what is told to them to speak. So reopening the eyes and ears. Verses 35 to 38. The blind man was asked by Jesus, did he, re did he believe in the Son of Man? And his, and his response was, uh, who's he? Like, I haven't got the foggiest. I was blind, remember? Don't know who you're talking about. And the Son of Man... Let's just think a, bit, a little bit about the Son of Man. The Son of Man features throughout the Old Testament, and most notably Daniel chapter 7, where after terrifying visions of destructive beasts that seem to have no equal and they're all powerful and all destroying, we then have this picture. Daniel 7, verse 13, 14. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting, de everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. With all the powers of deception and disinformation at hand, that is to blind and deafen people with tricks in the mind, the beasts were all destroyed. See, the beasts have been doing this disinformation, have been deception and, and have all these powers. They were the ones doing it, and they got destroyed. And it's the Son of Man who comes on the cloud of heaven and approaches the Ancient of Days, and all authority is given to him. Where's the beast gone to of deception? Destroyed, gone, forever. Gone with the lies, gone with the deceptions. The, the, the Christ is on full display. And the Son of Man is given authority and glory and sovereign power. All nations and the peoples of every language worship him. I'm glad this morning we prayed for Europe. I'm glad we prayed for Europe. It's not just Ukraine. It's not just Russia. Yes. It's not just China. It's not just Taiwan. Listen, church, and see. The Son of Man's dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And this is the cool bit. This same Son of Man was standing before the man who had been blind. Do you know who the Son of Man is? I haven't got the foggiest. I'm talking to you. And the response of the blind man was he worshipped him. He worshipped King Jesus. He worshipped the Son of Man who was standing there before him. That's all he could do. I was blind. But now I see. In church today, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. 
We can see it. Well, we'll see it later. We can hear the words and can, we can see the work of God. For we are, every Christian here who is here, every person is a product of the work of God. Each, each and every one of you here today is a work of God. And you are on full display. That Christ to save you testifies to the work of God. And that, my friends, is on full display to all to see. So today, if you are here and if you have no idea who the Son of Man is, who Jesus Christ is, ask someone who does. For they are a work of God. And God has been working in their, in their lives. And what God starts work on, he brings to completion. You see, to know Christ is one thing. To believe is to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the one who he declares himself to be, the Son of Man, whose dominion will never pass away. And how do I do that? Well, all you need to say is, I believe you, Jesus. Because that's, that's what the blind man did. I believe you, Jesus. I believe that you are the Son of Man. That you are this Son of Man. That you stood before the blind man and put mud on his eyes and then he washed it off so he could see. He was blind and then he could see. This Jesus is the Son of Man. And just as the blind man said, I believe and then worshipped him, so can you. So Jesus said to the one, so Jesus said that he came to give life and life to the full, and this life is for you to believe. And if you've never started believing in Jesus, well, start today. It's not a diet plan that you start for 120 days and finish. Them. No, it's start today. The Bible says that if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Saviour, then friends, he is your Lord and Saviour. You must see with the eyes of faith, faith that the Lord has given to you, he gives you sight to see. He puts mud on, the, mud on your eyes that after being washed by the Holy Spirit, you can see. I see it and I believe it. Amen. So today we're going to be celebrating communion, the Lord's Supper. For by this we declare our belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of Man, that we are indeed the Lord's people. For he has called us to be his people. And by consuming this together, we testify to each other that we believe. We're like the blind man. I believe and I worship you. Today, your belief may be weak or it might be strong. But know this, Christian. Christ never lets go of you. He holds on. None will be lost that are placed in the hands of the Father. For the Father and Christ are one. And never listen to the voices that say that your salvation and belief is, is, is all up to you. You've got to work at it. You've got to do this. You, oh, tomorrow I might lose my salvation. Never. Who saves you? Do we save ourselves and then say, Christ, here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm good enough. I'm good enough now. Oh, tomorrow I'm not really good enough. I'm, I'm not feeling so well now. It is Christ who gave his life for you. You didn't give your life for Christ. Christ sacrificed himself on the cross. It was Christ who kept the perfect life, not us. It was Christ that was raised to life resurrected as signifying that that's one that's what's going to happen to us we're going to be following christ just as re he was raised from the dead friends so will you showing the way that all those who follow christ will be like it is christ who is accomplishing the work of god in your hearts and minds 
We've got to know this, Christian. We've got to believe this. We've got to anchor this in our mind. We've got to guard our heart and our mind with these promises of God and never let them go. Actually, we won't because God holds on to us. But we keep on reminding ourselves. The blind man certainly did that. Because when John was writing this gospel, he would have had a very long conversation with this man. So the blind man also had voices in the background. Those voices who were telling him that he was making it all up. But how can I see? When you became a Christian, we too can see. We change because God works in us. People around you will see you and say that you're different. You've changed. I don't know what change is. And others will be unsure of what to quite make of you. And so then the final comment to the, to the once blind man, uh, Jesus said to him, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. See, blindness is to be in the dark. In darkness, many secrets are hidden. However, what happens when the light comes on? The darkness is no more. The secrets are exposed. The blind man had seen the light of Christ and he, could, and he can see both Christ for who he is. He had no idea who he was before, but now he could see. And of course, the whole natural world. He could see for the first time uh, faces. He'd felt faces. He had felt things with his hands and he could, he could now then see it. Imagine for the first time a snail carrying its own house on its back. Or an ant carrying a leaf many times its size. That would be extraordinary, wouldn't it? So light exposes those silent secrets. And it's in this sense that Jesus says that he comes in judgment. The blind will see and those who claim to see will be blind. And this was the case for the Pharisees who overheard the statement. See, their question to Jesus was, thinking that they could see and maybe get a response like, well, you know, you, you have an opportunity later on. Instead, they got the following response from Jesus. If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. They said that they could see their version of God, their light, yet they were deceived. And they deceived others as well. And their guilt remained on them. In fact, John 10 goes in to say, let me tell you about shepherds. I'll talk to you about what shepherds look like because you are the false shepherds. You are jumping over the wall. You're trying to take sheep away from me and I am the good shepherd. So chapters 9 and 10 work together. More about that next week. Let's think about discipleship just to close off with. There was a constant theme throughout this chapter about, about discipleship. <laughs> You want to be Jesus' disciples as well, the blind man said to them. It started off with a question from the disciples of Christ. For the disciples are simply learners of Christ. That's what a disciple is, a learner. I am only a learner. I've got my old plates on still. It just means I'm a disciple. Uh, by the way, if you're, if you're a Christian, you have old plates too. A key factor of being a disciple of Christ is the ability to see Christ. And the blind man certainly makes this point repeatedly clear. And when he saw Christ, he worshipped him. And repeatedly, the once blind man asked the Pharisees if they too wanted to be disciples of Christ, because obviously are asking all of these questions. And their response was, uh, they, could already, they, they can already see, so they have no need 
to follow Christ. However, in a very real sense, John has written his gospel so that we, the readers, can see Christ. We're in John 9 at the moment, but if you go back a few chapters, back to John chapter 5, and in John 5, there is this, the pool of Siloam features again. The pool of Siloam features that there was a, a lame man who had been beside this, this pool for 39 years. And Jesus came up to him and said, pick up your bed and walk. And so he did and healed him. And we would be thinking, well, this is tremendous. This is great. And you'd be saying, well, of course this man's going to be a disciple of Jesus because Jesus has healed him. What he did, though, what this, blind, what this lame man did was, well, um, stick a dagger in the back of Jesus. That's about what he did. He, he, he did everything he could to put distance between him and, and Christ because he too was healed on the Sabbath. All he could do was pour rubbish on Christ for Christ had healed him. And this rubbishing of Jesus was done in response to the intense questioning of the religious leaders at the temple. So then John takes us then into the temple in the next couple of chapters that we've been through where Christ makes, Jesus makes certain declarations of who he is, that he is the great I am, that he is the water of life, he is the light of the world, and that he is the bread of life. All these are synonymous to knowing who God is from the book of Exodus. Because there God revealed before Moses, I am who I am. I am the light of the world as a pillar of light. I am the bread of the world because manna came down from heaven. I am the water of life because God said to Moses, strike this rock and water will come out of it. What was shown in Exodus is repeated by Christ, who says, you had it then, I'm here, right now. So then when we come to John 9, the light of the world opens the, the eyes of the blind and the once blind man can now see and the works of God are on full display for all to see. And the once blind man says, his response is, all I can do is worship. I can see and all I can do is worship. For that is what followers of Jesus do when they see Jesus. All we can ever do is worship him. And this is in complete contrast to the now walking lame man and the religious leaders who taught about God. All they can do when they see Jesus is go, yeah, nah. Not interested. Talk to the face that cares. Talk to the hand that cares. I'm not interested. And so they reject. They have seen the works of God on full display. And they reject. So Christ accepted their decision of rejection and said, I agree, you will be rejected forever, eternal. The gravity is enormous. We weep and we mourn for those who go like this to the works of God that are on full display. Their ears are stopped, their blindfolds are on, yet they say they can see and hear, and they do this. And Christ will accept their decision of rejection. a sobering thought. For us here today at Mount Evelyn Presbyterian, you are followers of Christ 
For Christ has made you see, and by seeing you believe. And by believing you have hope, and with hope you have faith, and through faith we have love. And, and for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes will have eternal life. Do you agree? Each one of you are a work of God on full display. Treasure this. Display this. So those within your sphere of influence will go, I can see now. I can hear now. I believe that Jesus is my Lord and my Saviour. That's what we pray for. We have hope where we have time. See Jesus, follow him and worship him. Let's pray. Father God, we we thank you, Lord, that you have given us life that we can see, that you've given us faith to believe, that we can understand, perceive, we can feel, engage, and know that you are certainly in us through your Holy Spirit, its presence within us. We thank you, Lord God, that, 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 that we too can believe these things. Oh, Lord God, we pray for those around us who say, they can, who say they can see, but Lord, do not have any idea who you are. Lord, we, we bring them before you. We name them. You know them, Lord God, because you hear their names constantly from our lips, from our hearts. We pray, Lord, that they would see, that you would make them see. Lord, that mud would be on the eyes of their heart and the Holy Spirit would wash that off and they would see and believe and know that you are the Son of Man. And Father, as we come to approach a very important meal, the Lord's Supper, may it be a reminder to us, a strengthen our faith in you. And may we see and believe. I was blind, but now I see. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We're going to come and sing a precious.